Everyone is welcome here, it's time to make new friends. Rock with me to you, come on, feel your Glen Carrot. Share a dram with the spirit of Edmonton. Sluncha! Sluncha. Welcome. Welcome to you, the viewer. Welcome to our fantastic panel. All of these three gentlemen right here. It's the after dram. Means it's time to unwind. So put your feet up, grab a dram or two. And uh, uh, well, I've got a beer too. So uh, a dram or two and a water. My wife's telling me you're pushing the water. It's the after dram. We're going to have fun today. And, and we, we, we've already had a lot of fun. So as a quick recap to our evening, Dr. Don had this question. Uh, Essentially, just chapter six, maybe part of chapter seven of, of this book right here, Blending 101, the Canadian Whiskey Masterclass. Boom, that one right there. Time to get something for Christmas. And if you watch the first one, you'll see that I asked Don three questions that came up in this book too, uh, which means I have to read it over Christmas. But it's a quick read. This will take me it'll take a night. And it's a good read. Something, something to do. And uh, we're doing chapter six to nine right now. It was fun. It was informative. It was very tasty as I did the black sea cask. And right now I'm on the PD quarter cask, which is great. Uh, so let's do a, a round of introduction. Everyone knows what I'm, I'm doing right now. But let's talk to Don Steve Lee and go to Dr. Don. Find out what's in your glasses tonight, gentlemen. Oh, and introduce yourselves, please, if you have a handle you want us to call you by. Well, I'm Don, Last Straw Distillery. And tonight I am drinking... Whiskey from North Seven. It's a four grain. Oh, hang on this way. It's four grain whiskey. They're an Ottawa small distillery. Uh, very cool bunch of guys. If you get a chance, go out and check them out. But uh, that's what I'm drinking tonight. And Don, were these the guys that were in your distillery for a while you helped out? Is no, no. They, they were from way before me. Uh, they were oh, one of the God. early uh, licensees and uh, licensed distilleries in Ontario. Nice. Thank you, sir. Steve And welcome. Yeah. Hi, hi from uh, London, England. Uh, my name's Steve Lee. I'm uh, the distiller from Douglas Distillery and appreciator of many things whiskey. Uh, I would love to open the bottles that I'm bringing back to Canada, but uh, yeah. I'm drinking a Glenlivet 15 right now because that's all you can get down at the, hello, hello the local corner store. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Although, before I let you go, I want to uh, tell me two bottles you're most proud of finding in London? Um, well, I would have loved to get the new Compass Box. I managed to visit Compass Box there, and James was a, a very gracious host when I showed up. But I have a, a bottle of whiskey from Holyrood Palace uh, Distillery, um, which is the Queen's uh, home in Edinburgh. So it was okay. kind of a rare find I haven't seen before. So. I'm nice. anxious to uh, open that when I get home. I love those. I love stuff that eats like, what the hell is that? Yeah. <laughs> I have never seen that. And for people that live around whiskey and shop a lot, that, that's a surprising one. Good. And a visit, you know, I, I'm always a big fan when I'm traveling to look for travel exclusive products. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll be visiting the airport and uh, I've eyed up a couple of uh, travel exclusive bottles already you know what you're getting good for you yeah <laughs> thank you kind sir and dr don what do we have the author uh, yeah i'm dr don livermore master blender for the higher walker distillery and i'm i'm with you because i think we uh we had uh, on the same wavelength from the first section is the lot 40 peated quarter cask and uh hopefully uh you can uh snap up a bottle this uh holiday season this is our first uh release on the rye exploration series and uh uh, from what I can tell, they're going quite well. Uh, so it's a it's a dram that's 100% rye that was aged in uh, ex peated quarter cast. So you get the spiciness of rye and the smokiness of a peated scotch. So it's a very unique dram, uh, but uh, I'm quite enjoying it tonight uh, as I start cool. my holidays. And a good way to do it. And yeah, that's absolutely. what I've got in mind as well. Uh, peated quarter cast, 54.3. Did the percentage didn't change, did it? it yeah, it did. Still you're, you're drinking my lab sample still. <laughs> fifty-five five yeah. is what it ultimately ended up being. So, uh, fifty-five yeah. five. I'm being yeah. ripped off one point two percent. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> no. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know, uh, uh, we had this tasting in in the summer, and uh, you know what, Steve Lee, you were there as well. Were you not? You, you were at our yeah, our, yeah. 
And, then, and you guys were drinking that black seed cask, and uh, that was that was delicious. Yeah, I, I certainly it? enjoyed that cherry nose on that. Yeah, the, the fur for all levels are out of the world, and that's one if you put down on a GC, it's it's fantastic, Damn. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, all of us have something fantastic in the glass. I've got Naughty right beside me, mm -hmm. and uh, you know what, Don? Just let, let's do this now before I forget. I want to make sure that no, it's Don, Doctor Don's Doctor Don. <laughs> this is this is what I want to point out because you've got this coming out right away, and I was really excited about it. Yep. So uh, yeah, I'll be getting two, maybe three of that because because the Alberta Scott said he's doing a beer finish, but it's not a beer finish. Tell us nope. what. Nope. Uh, this is um, a mash bill from a stout beer. And uh, the only difference was we uh, we used a, a whiskey yeast in it as opposed to the beer yeast. Mm -hmm. uh, we yeah. took the gravity right down to uh, to zero and we distilled it twice, uh, twice through a column, a pot still with a column. So it was four plate. We, we did a fast run through at the strip and then we slowed it down, did a spirit run. And uh, it went into a recharred barrel from uh, an ex-California wine that was recharred to about a number three. Nice. Excellent. And, uh, and it, had, it had a sister cask. There was two of them. And the first one was released at four months old as a spirit only. And okay. uh, it went quite well. People loved it. We have a lot of fans for it. And a lot of people are excited about this coming up. So do you use chocolate and coffee malts in that? Uh, it was a toasted malt, so it was a, a two-row and then a toasted, like a Munich malt, I believe. Uh, yeah. nice. that, do, you find, do you find the roasted notes come over in the distillation? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. As wow. a white spirit, they really come through, but then when they mi mingle with the char, they really show up as like a chocolate note. Wow, beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love the experimentation with the different malts, too. I really like that. It's it, it's fun. Be anything you're experimenting with is kind of fun. It's it's good. I like it all. And sorry, I had one more as well that I'm doing. It's the 21 year old space side single malt cask that we're doing. And any was there anything on that one, Doctor Don? Anytime soon? Uh that that's uh that's a, that's a yeah that's the Pike Creek one. I think you're referring yeah. to. Yep. I think it's over my shoulder here. Uh, yeah, that one was aged in X. Uh, it's funny that Steve Lee has that bottle in front of him today. Uh, those are, uh, I got them from Sandy Hislop, the bl master blender. So that it's a combination of uh, Abelauer and uh, Glenn Levitt barrels. He wouldn't tell me which was which, but I'm, I'm sure it was just a mix of the two brands because that's used the blender for them. And it's it's the Pike Creek recipe just finished in in casts from, from uh, Chivas. So, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm going to go to Don, then Steve Lee. Did you have any questions from the pro oh, from the previous session that you wanted to ask? No. And I'll just drink whiskey as you do this. Well, uh, unfortunately, I uh, I went for a nap and was woken up just before this because uh, we've been putting in some really long hours at the distillery. So uh, unfortunately, I didn't catch the first hour. My apologies. Um, oh, I shouldn't have put you on the spot, Don. Sorry. That, no, that's, that's, my that, fault. that's okay. That's okay. I, I, I didn't think I was going to nap as long as I did. But uh, you know what? Cat naps are okay. These things are good things to have every once in a while. If you can no, they, 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 they are. And, and we, we've got a busy season coming up. So we're actually going to stay open uh, Christmas Eve till 11 p.m. We're going to stay open wow. New Year's Eve till 11 p.m. So. Yeah, make make uh make uh make hay when the sun shines. They say so. You're gonna have a busy two weeks. Yeah. Steve so. Uh, oh, needed sorry. that cat nap. Nope, needed that cat nap. That's it. Good. Well, you're fresh and you're on the ball for us tonight. That's good. Yeah. That's what we want, Steve Lee. Um. Well, I had one cat. I had one question. I saw a photo of uh, that barrel, um, the 18 year old. And I don't know if it was the same barrel that's it's being released, but it looked like a new oak barrel yeah. uh, there. And what's the story or the history on the barrels yeah, for that? So the lot 4018 year was probably aged in a once used American bourbon barrel. That's our typical thing when we put our uh, lot 40 in the casks. Uh, I switched it over into a seasoned oak cask. And what a seasoned oak cask from our barrel producer that we get it from means the, the wood itself uh, was dried in the natural air for in their yard for uh, four years before the assembly of the cask. They're feeling the longer it sits out in, in the rain, uh, I, again, I've never validated it, but their feeling is um, as the sunshine and the water uh, gets an opportunity to leach out a lot of the tannins in the wood is their, their thought, what happens there. 
Um, they also probably get a little bit of microbial degradation as the feeling that so they open up the ligand flavors a little bit. Um, whether it does or not, that's that's their their feeling of it. So we we moved that whiskey around 2016, 2017 into that barrel that you saw on my Instagram shot. It looks fairly new yeah. and and <laughs> they're not cheap barrels either. <laughs> Uh, but we, we moved it over into that seasoned oak cask uh, around that time, and it just gave a spectacular new wood finish, which is typical for, for a Lot 40 uh, blend. So uh, I hope the response on the 18-year will uh, what I think it should be. Uh, you got an 18-year-old rye, which they're very hard to come by, if at all. Uh, uh, I know what our rye inventories are like. Um, and I hope our single cask release program starts nicely. Uh, uh, it's something I, th I think I think I've got a lot of experiments going on. Um, if we see a good response, which which I hope, uh, hopefully we can see some more interesting things uh, around Lot 40 and, and and maybe other brands as well. So, uh, so that's a seasonal cast. They're they're fun to play with, Steve. If you can get them, um, yeah. yeah, they're not cheap though. I don't know what they're going for. Uh, probably two or three hundred dollars a barrel, but uh, uh, but it gives an excellent taste taste to, uh, to a rye whiskey, for sure. Yeah, that's not a bad price actually for a barrel yeah. right now. We're we're certainly seeing the the barrel prices, good quality seasoned wood. The price is going up. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they've gone up since we bought since I bought that one. Maybe maybe I misquoted someone. Where can I? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get comments. Where'd you get it for that price? <laughs> uh, <I want laughs> they may go up, but uh, yeah. Um, and then out of that to after that, because we would have filled the barrel up at that, at that point, because we re, we call it regaging is the word we use internally. We take it from one barrel to the next, so we would have filled it to the top, of course. Uh, and uh, what ended up coming out of it was 154 bottles uh, of, of cash strength whiskey. So that barrel size is, is 190 liters. So that's not too bad for evaporation from that 2017 team time frame uh, to get that much much liquid out of it. Um, what we ultimately end up selling, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm thinking they'll probably sell 125 to 130 bottles and probably keep some back just to do some whiskey tastings uh, would be my guess is what they'll, they'll do with it. So, so you fill the barrel right up to the top. You guys don't leave a, a gap in the top of the barrel. No, we fill them as, as high as we can. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, don't see any and issues. With the from the top as well. And filled from the top as well. So it, it, it's. We we do yeah yeah um, yeah we we don't see bungs popping off um, I mean we got we got uh, warehouse people that are constantly going through our warehouse anyway I think if they were to see any strange stuff going with bungs and things like that they're they're instructed to hammer them in and, and stuff but uh, uh, don't don't see any issue and then our our loss Steve Lee is uh, I think we talked a little bit about it last week is is uh, yeah. we and this is from a hole. We lose 10% a year uh, on the first year of fill, and then 3% every year after that. So my guess is that 7% differential is probably leakage, uh, right. just because they're using barrels over and over again. They leak, they'll fall apart, things happen, right? So that's kind of probably what we'll see in, in the Windsor, Ontario as, a, as an angel share loss. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. I've got a question for everybody. And, and so it seems like it's directed to John because I, uh, John, Don, because I'm using his quote. So, and you, you guys know I like my quotes. All of you on our programs have had quote after quote after quote. So, uh, here we go. After the base was blended, blenders were, uh, added at no more than 10% of the total volume. So, uh, Don talked about this previously. Blenders included. American whiskeys, younger age whiskey of at least two years, Paxaret Sherry, French Vermouth, Italian Vermouth, bitters, South African brandy, Jamaican rum, American whiskey, orange bitters, or prune wine. Tons of things were added. And I'm sure other things as well, on top of the sugar, on top of the tea that we already talked about. The quality control and blending order of the whiskeys were also documented. And that was kind of cool. And you made people in your book look at that, what they were doing first and the lighter to the to the darker. But what I'm thinking, this has tons of possibilities. How much of a connoisseur the with all these other spirits then if they were going to blend these into their own spirits? Because I'm... It's one to know your own spirits intimately, but something very different to know all of those intimately and the taste profiles of all of those. So I'm wondering how much they would. And uh, Steve Lee and Dawn later, if you've blended in the the 111th or 9.09, if you've used that rule, 
just we'll yeah. throw that in. Yeah. So at this point in history, from that quote, uh, they would have never been adding uh, sugar or tea at this point. That stopped yeah. uh, probably about 1890 or so. That was the last uh, recipes I could see them doing that in. So okay. something changed in there. They, they must have put a legislation in there to stop that practice. Um, so these, how well did they know them? I actually suspected they know them very well. Um, okay. Uh, I think Hiram Walker actually owned a lot of these distilleries. Um, I, I, as a blender today, I know them very well. I, I know other people's spirits that I use very, very well. I know exactly what to do to whiskey. Um, so my suspicion, is they're very familiar with them. I, I even today, if we'll use, uh, use a, a sherry and a blend and everything, you can kind of dial in, you'll know what will work and what will actually start clashing. Um, yeah. it, it's something, something that we attune ourselves to. So, um, again, um, this is something that's always been done. I'll, I'll reiterate to the audience that uh, Canadian whiskey, uh, uh, right from the very early days, was blending these things in, and hence, hence where we arrived at the 909. I'll add one more thing, and I probably do talk about it in the book. Um, these things, people will say, is it a a method you're kind of shortcutting and stuff? Actually, it's not, uh, in my perspective, uh, at least on how well we look at it. These tend to be the expensive ingredients. When I go yeah. to go to uh, my supply management, you want to buy what? You want to buy, you know how much American whiskey or bourbon is today if you want to blend bourbon into a whiskey? Good luck, A, finding bourbon to purchase. And if you do, it, it, it's not cheap. Um, uh, likewise with sherries and things like that. So again, it's just not a paint to a painter's palette. It's just add one more dynamic to it. Some whiskeys I'll, 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 I'll utilize it and some, some I don't. Some, some of the lot 40 peter quarter casting I'm having here. No, I, I didn't add scotch to it. I did not. I, this was authentically aged in a peated quarter cast to, to bring in that flavor. So it depend, depends what, uh, what you're trying, trying to do. Thank you, sir. Don. Um, we, we, we've, ne we, we've never used the rule. Uh, like we've, we've never added anything to any of our whiskeys. Um, and all our releases have been single cask. Um, mm. that that's, not necessarily anything beyond we have limited amounts of cast when we want to release a whiskey that's the cast we have um so we we've never really had the opportunity to do any any blending or any mixing in the only thing i have done just on little minor experiments is i will take a drop of sherry and throw it into a whiskey to see if hey what would that do to the whiskey if i were to put it into a sherry uh, cast yep. we've considered that um, never gotten to that point because every time I look at the price of a sherry cask or a port butt, it's yeah. like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that, but <laughs> it's justifying what I'm saying. They're not cheap to do this stuff. <laughs> no, it's, it's not at all. Even I was looking at the, some Lafroy quarter casts and even to get those over to Canada, it's, it's not yeah. cheap. Yeah. So. yeah. Steve Lee, did you get any of, the, well, you did, you got some of the yard bag or were they Lafroy? We've, we've had both. We've had uh Lafroy and our bag. Uh, yes. fortunately we're in a great, you know, kind of burgeoning craft distilling industry in BC. And we kind of piggyback on a much larger distillery with shelter point. Um, they've, they've yeah. shared some barrels with us. So, uh, we've been really fortunate and they've been really helpful with other distilleries in the province as well. Um, we haven't added anything to our whiskey. There's no plans to add anything to our whiskey. Um, but that's not to say that that creativity of that 9% might be in our future. Um, you know, I think the ultimate goal is, does the product taste good? Yeah. And are we fully transparent with what we're doing? And so I, I think those key things, you know, is does the product taste good, whether it has caramel coloring in it or not, or whether it has, uh, what I found with some of the recipes with Hiram Walker there on the older ones, they actually had new make spirit in the, in the blend yeah. there. I think it was high wines or low wine stone. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, that was uh, caught me off guard too. When I was really, but, uh, that was the very early on in the days, uh, very early on they were, were doing those things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this leads me to the next question because, uh, we're hitting when we talk about this one of the biggest barriers to the acceptance of canadian whiskey as a premium product the 111th or 9.09 rule and and here's a quote and no we've already explained it it's already okay. done here we have with the thing you state dumb there's a historical yeah. evidence that canadian whiskey recipes right from the very beginning 1890s contain rum scotch and other spirits added to enhance specific flavors this has been done since the inception of blending in our whiskey category. 
blending with this type of latitude has always been part of our tradition. Fruit juices, this last part was really important to have. Fruit juices, neutral grain spirits, NGS, uh, or flavoring preparations from flavor houses, however, cannot be added to Canadian whiskey as it's against the law. So that's really important to put. Yeah. I really like that because I think that comes out a lot and it's within the american industry you hear yeah. that they refer to that so i'm glad yeah, there, there's, a, there's a whiskey category in the us where you can i think get up to it may even be just as much five percent aged whiskey and the rest can be neutral spirit yeah and it still yeah. falls under a whiskey type category they got 42 definitions of whiskey in the us so for Thank us you. it's just one it's one definition that that catches all uh, of what we do so and yeah, nope. go ahead. I didn't want to cut you off. You go yeah. ahead. No, I, and I think that's where some of the confusion is because our traditional Canadian whiskeys, uh, I know with, 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 uh, with Don and Stevie Lee, what they're making, they're making full, robust style of whiskeys, but the traditional ones are very light. That's that's where we came from. A lot of a lot of people wanted light whiskey back in the, those days, and and the thought is, oh yeah, Canadian whiskeys are adding neutral grain spirits uh, as part of this 909, and we can't, we we cannot add neutral grain spirits as part of the 909. It's quite clear. I, I know, uh, Steve, you did mention back in the early days, they're adding high wines to to that whiskey, but that was really between the 1880s to 1890s, and then shortly thereafter in the 1900s, I couldn't see recipe they were adding high wines to. That somehow stopped. Something changed in there. They must have change the rules or laws I, I can't explicitly put a date to when it changed but it was it was somewhere in there just reading our recipe books um but uh it's quite clear we cannot put fruit juice neutral grain spirit or go to flavor house and add cinnamon to it now if we do and we, and we do have that's the flavored in in canada they're actually called a liqueur so uh so we do have uh our own like a wiser's old-fashioned that's a liqueur it's not a whiskey Right, so we, we do. That's where that falls. Don't help me out with this. Uh, your hopped whiskey, if you remember way back when, what would that have yeah. been? Because was it, it would have on barrel or with the hops? Uh, it was dry yeah. hopped. So we're adding yeah. the the hop oils after the aging process. That's where we're at. So what was that it. called then? That would have been fell under the flavored whiskey category because you're adding something in that's not aged, right? So, and the, and you know what? The easy way to tell, I'll, I'll give you the hint. If you want to really. Mm -hmm. I was going to grab a bottle. I probably can't see it on the screen, but if you no, actually you see, ahead. if you actually see an ingredient statement on yep. the back of a bottle, that means it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a flavored whiskey or a liqueur. Yeah. No, Whereas a, a, a Canadian whiskey will not have that. It'll be directly on the front Canadian whiskey. Right. So that, that's the quick way of telling if something is, is, uh, is, is a not, not a Canadian whiskey. All right. Now, I'm going to introduce a notion that not too many people are talking about, and I don't really know why. Yeah. And Steve Lee, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, for you, because you did use the Lafroy, you did use the Ardbeg cast. And, well, and Don, you're, you're, you're thinking about different casts, and, and you will be using cherry casts at one point soon, I'm pretty sure. But 9.09 or 111 rule doesn't include the spirit that's contained in the walls of the barrel. And there is. When you get a wet barrel or something that hasn't been dried out, you have something in the walls of that barrel, yeah. and that gives you a flavoring. That is there. And everywhere, they do it in the States. They do it in Scotland. They do it in Ireland. We all have flavoring in it. I don't know what percentage is in there. But do we think, any of you, that one day the amount of liquid that's contained in the walls will be analyzed or projected. And then you have to take that away from the 9.09 .09, if we're being really specific here. You know what I mean? And I don't know how you would ever do that. And who uh, Davin was saying that there's, I can't remember what he was saying, four liters of liquid that could be contained in the walls of these 200 liter barrels. That would be a lot of flavoring added to it if it was a freshly emptied barrel, I guess. Right? So I'll throw that out to all of you as I'm drinking my new <laughs> I don't know who wants to answer that first. <laughs> Don, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I have gotten, bar I've received barrels from uh, ex-bourbon distilleries and, and you can plainly see that if you hold them upside down over the course of a couple of days, you're going to get a, like a liter or, or so out of them. Um, but I think that's the whole point of using a uh, once used bourbon cask is you are trying to pull that essence into your whiskey you're trying to have it affect it um and that's why like when, when don was saying they, they have a 10 percent loss in the first year 
well, it's not all evaporating. It's not all leaking. I think a lot of it is saturating into the wood. And that's where a good section of that loss is because I know all my brand new barrels that I've ever used, oh, yeah. I was shocked after a year how much was gone. Uh, and then and it I does think seem you to told slow me like ten to fifteen percent in the first year, and then you're going yeah. to the four or five after, right? Yeah, it, we do, we don't get them refilling in a used barrel, Don. But yes, I agree with you on a new barrel. Yeah, it it, it absorbs absorbs it in. Oh absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. If the barrel's wet, I don't find we lose. I think it's more leaking on our part from that mm -hmm. from that. So don't we want to consider this a type of flavoring? I know it imparts flavor. Can't we call it that? It was, shouldn't they call it that in the States? Shouldn't they call it that in Scotland when they're getting cherry? And, I, don't, I, don't so. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. No, I yeah, don't I, I don't think so either. I think it's so minimal that uh, it's, it's not a factor. But I, I think one of the factors, and this is maybe a question for Dawn, is, is as the industry grows and changes, um, is there going to be more rules put into place uh, to protect the Canadian whiskey brand, because we're we're already starting to see some uh, really creative methods. And, and one of the things we I just had a discussion with a uh, distiller recently is the term cask strength. Uh, we saw something that was coming out at you know just above fifty percent, knowing that it's a young whiskey and them calling it cask strength. Um, are we going to see some rules implemented in the future to protect those terms? or protect Canadian whiskey? I, my, my opinion is I don't think they'll touch Canadian whiskey rules. I've talked to some excise officers who sat in the committees back in the day, and they fought to get a minimum of 40%. They, they were talking about 30 35% uh, or be, leaving it wide open. And that went through in the 1970s, 1980s, that they, they restricted to 40%. And for what, I can t for what I can tell, talking to large producers, because we sit on the... Uh, uh, the the group that uh, lobbies the Canadian government, it's, uh, we like the definitions the way they are and not to touch them. And we like the creativity of it. I, I don't think they'll change the rules. Dolphin. There's no, I don't know how you can even monitor that. Um, I, I like our, our, I liked our adaptability and creativity and let's leave it alone. It is what it is and let's celebrate. And that's, that's my side of it. And my, I think I talked, we talked about this last week is I find that, uh, if I'm it's almost like what Don was talking about, putting some sherry in, into it, I find 1% comes in. So if you, if you want to see how much sherry is coming out in or what you would look like in a barrel, I find that's kind of what I do is about 1% by volume um, is what I think will come into your product, roughly. I, that's not a soaking wet with liquid that much on the bottom of the barrel kind of thing, but but 1% is kind of kind of what we see as if we're going to try something new. That would be my litmus test. Yeah. Don't change the rules. I'm still I, sticking I like with my, my, my thought. <laughs> if, if the barrel has four liters of liquid, four liters out of 200 is one fiftieth. One fiftieth of your barrel is a flavor that you're getting not just the wood, obviously. It's the liquid that's in there before. I don't know. I, I think it would. See, I, I, I see. It, so if it, I said 100, it'd be two liters. But that's roughly what I what I do. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Because they're two hundred liter yeah, barrels, yeah. roughly. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, All right. I, I'm beating. It's a great to be. It's great to be. Agree yeah. with me. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's talk about uh, production on an industrial scale, but this still works with Steve Lee and you, Don, as well, hmm. because uh, uh, yeah, let's there's let's do this for production at an industrial scale. Boom. There you go. Uh, blenders switch their calculations from volume to weight. I thought this was really cool. When you're working with large volumes, even the slightest change in temperature can cause volume changes significant enough to skew the recipe. But no matter the temperature of the whiskey, it's weight that will never change. Now, I thought this was really cool because I teach this to students, but I never thought of it in terms of blending for some reason. It just something you teach, but you're not relating it to something else. But it makes me wonder if there's other elements that would change or modify the final outcome of your spirit, even if the proportions of your tech test batch, because Steve Lee and Don, you have test batches, you have things that you've tried on a smaller scale, mm -hmm. and then you're making it to a larger scale. How do they change if it's not just the math? Because it, let's say you do the math perfectly, it should taste exactly the same, but it doesn't. Something changes. 
what could change it? Hmm. I, I mean, we're doing our volume on weight and we're not doing a lot of blending right now. So, um, I, I like the only thing that I could have reference to that would be like our gin, our gin experiments were done on a small scale and then we, yep. we tried to scale them and they actually did scale. Uh, but we were all, everything was on weight. The amount of, the amount of spirit we used, the amount of botanical, everything went to weight and weight and time. We just kept that the same and it seemed to work out. Yeah, it, it makes it way more consistent. And, and from my, from when I say industrial scale, I, I know for, for Steve Lee and Don here, 85,000 liter tanks are what we have. So if you're making a batch of Wiser's Deluxe at 85,000 liters, a marginal change in temperature is going to really skew that recipe, uh, e even by the slightest. Um, but weight, weight is bang on uh, every time. And the other issue we got to remember um, for us, and I'm not sure about the the warehouses for these guys that were the age whiskey, is we got extreme temperature changes. Our, our outside temperature is what the temperature of our whiskey will be so coming into february our barrels will get down to minus five degrees celsius coming in dumping it into a tank and, and blending it up at minus five versus in the summertime where they're 28 degrees celsius that's a big volume change yeah. and you see it at the gas pump right these are things are adjusted to 15 degrees celsius yeah. i'm not sure about alberta itself but <laughs> it is, it is yes. well. <laughs> but at least ontario they're 15 degrees celsius if so when you're talking bringing whiskey from a cold warehouse or a very warm warehouse becomes even more important to to measure by weight and that's what i mean by by the slightest temperature change and, and it'll, it certainly will happen and i, I put it in my book because and i hope i hope these guys will scale their whiskey production to to large tanks and it'll have to be something they'll consider to keep consistency in, in their in their blends too that and you know that, that it's it's a consideration so I guess my question is this, if, if, if it, it is proportional by weight and it's always bang on, is there something that could skew it other than your proportion? Something where you thought it was perfect and it came if, out. If there was a quality well. problem in the, the spirits that we we're blending together, that okay. that's, that could happen. Um, right. Other than that, you'd be surprised Dolph, how consistent we can be. We don't okay. put it into a barrel then, until it's, until it's bang on. We don't waste our time of putting subpar stuff. Uh, I, again, I know I, we're not more ex the larger size. Maybe we're less experimental. It's more about consistently making a product. Whereas I can understand the nuances on a smaller scale. Yeah, I don't know if it's good or not. We'll put it in a barrel, see what happens. Um, yeah, yeah, you, you're kind of smiling, Don, as you probably had that conversation before. Oh yeah, nice. uh, yeah. <laughs> but for us, I, I, once I set a recipe, it's in it's in stone, Dolph. It's in stone. Uh, yeah. Okay, and and what Don was saying about the the gin made sense for me too because I'm picturing what you think should be in the gin, but then when you make it on a much grander scale, I'm wondering how close you have to be when you're measuring it, Don. At first, like is it to a tenth or to a hundredth, and then you're multiplying it by a hundred, and you're just it's a hundred times bigger, two hundred times bigger. I'm not sure. Well, that's pretty much how we did it. Um, you know, you you you'd want to make a two liter batch, or you want to make a two hundred liter batch, so you just do the math and scale it up and everything's measured in grams. So you just increase the amount of botanical by that amount. Yeah. I'm assuming it should work proportionally it, as a math teacher. I'm hoping it works a lot. Yeah. Most of the time, <laughs> but I was thinking there could be things that would throw things off. So quality control works for me, Don, I could picture that and something happening, but apart from that, there's nothing else that will really skew it unless your math is off is what you're telling me. Right. I like having faith yeah. in math. Yeah. <laughs> M math is law. Yeah. It's yeah. absolute. All right. Yes. Uh, it's li literally, literally absolute. About numbers again. <laughs> I love that pun. <laughs> Don was saying that uh, for non. So let's 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 go from the the one eleventh nine point oh nine rule all the way to the cold the, the kill filtering rule. So let's okay. go from one thing to the next that everyone wants to talk about. Yep. Uh, so we're chill filtering, and Don, you say uh, there's a debate as to the strength that you should distill to ensure that it's not cloudy, 43 45%, and I'm wondering, you, you state it in the book, but I, I want to know if you want to tell us why there's a debate yeah. between these as opposed yeah. to always yeah. doing 46 46 So whiskey turning cloudy is recipe dependent. It's all brand dependent. I, it's not a rule of thumb. 
whether Don's brands or Steve Lee's brands are at 45% or mine at 45% because it does also matter the type of spirit that goes into it. So I can make a 45% spirit if it's double distilled and went through a rectifier, all those compounds that would fall out of solution aren't in it anyway. So there shouldn't be an issue. Now, if I pot distill, like 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 uh, Don's talked about here on a single pot still, so a lot of those fatty acid esters will end up in it. So that spirit at 45% might behave differently. The molecule, yeah. So he's uh, so he has it, yeah. He knows what I'm talking about. So the these molecules that are on the flavor wheel that I ha that I have, each has its own solubility point. Do you know what do what do you know what I mean by that? So yep. it will like to dissolve in alcohol more than it likes to dissolve in water. So as yep. soon as you start changing the water, to alcohol, some of these things will start turning cloudy. That's what I mean by falling out of solution. And that's the point where you need to chill filter. The thing I have with chill filtration and the marketing concept behind it, and as a scientist and as somebody who, who likes rules and goes by things, the problem I have is what is chill? Is it really chilled or a little bit chilled? Oh, but what is chill? It's not defined. No, you, you got what I'm saying, Don. <laughs> ah, this is non-chill filtered. So when I bring those casks in that I talked about that in February that are sitting at minus five degrees Celsius, and then I don't turn my chiller on to chill filter it, but I run it through my filter anyway. Does that still qualify chill as chill? Is it? To I me, didn't turn the chiller I would on. argue that point, yeah. <laughs> myself so but what what's your cutoff no point definition. though there's no no cutoff so um we do know that chill first tracing works uh, otherwise we wouldn't do it and th there's no doubt about it you, you know mm -hmm. there the esters and, and there's some sesterols that, that come out of the wood that it'll, they'll get pulled out but they're at such a small small parts per billion that we have run it through our panelists and, and i have to probably do i love to do a master class on it someday the same sample before chiller, after chiller. It'd be tough to do because you need dark blue glasses. <laughs> but yeah, I'd love okay. to be able to put it in front blue. of the. <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd have to put it in front of some, and you can tell that I know our panelists within a ninety-five percent confidence cannot tell the difference. And that's our standard. When we when we do sensory work, we go work on a ninety-five. There's a tables and there's all kinds of math. I know you'd like that on another day, Dolph. But there's all kinds of math in behind that yep. that they can't tell the difference. So even when we do our day-to-day -day sensory, we'll we'll do sensory on a tank, whether it's before or an after chiller. We we've just known that for many many years that yeah, you really can't tell. We do know it's pulling out, but not to the degree that you think it's pulling it out. Uh, it just does enough of yeah. polishing that it'll, it'll make it clear. So there's some definition things around it to me that I have trouble with. And, and, and the ask from our whiskey community is this non chill filtered. And they, and people insist, I've had people come up to whiskey fest to me saying is I, I want a non chill filtered whiskey and they insist. And I know the difference cause I see it from a day to day basis that, that it's not, and it's a tough question and it's, it's hard to convince somebody of that. Um, but, um, and then it's important to do. The other topic I talk about in, in the book, too, is what does filtration mean? Yes. So and every, all of them are filtered. Yeah. So there's different methods of filtration, right? There's a nominal filtration where you actually just separates particulate on particle size. That's uh, a Paul filter or a sock filter, just basically taking and we need to filter. We have to filter as distillers. By law, you can't have any more than a 20 micron particle in your in your liquid to sell to somebody because you don't want people choking, right? Hmm. So all whiskey is filtered. Whether you think of it, adult, because when you drain a barrel, you got the black pieces coming out, Dolph. When you well, run it through a sock filter minimum to try to take those things out. So all whiskey is filtered. So when somebody says, I want something non-chill filtered, well... Always there is an filter. independent bottler that actually puts that in there. Now they I don't the know if they, filter it <laughs> they, 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 they put the charcoal. They actually <laughs> put the charcoal bits in post filtration. Oh, did they? Okay, okay. yeah, happened. I'm not aware so of that brand. Oh it. my god, yeah, yeah, I well, was shocked I to find that out. Yeah. I, I do like their whiskey out. because you know <laughs> it, it's an adult snow globe. You move it around, the little black oh, it's bits. Fantastic. It, it, yeah. It, yeah. It's great. It, it yeah. really is. The problem I have with it, the whole defining part of it, is that there's just yeah. it's a loosey goosey term that is not. Do you really know what you're 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 talking about when we talk about non chill filtered whiskey? I think I think that's the point. I mean, we know it does something. It does pull things out to add some clarity to the whiskey, uh, but at the end of the day, what does it mean? 
anyway, that, that's the problem I have with it. Well, and, and there's I'm, two arguments usually case. after it. What does it pull out? Is it flavor or is it mouthfeel? And, and this comes up often. Is it one or the other or both? And I'll, I'm going to give that to Don and Steve Lee, what you guys think, and then we'll come back up to Don, and I'll tell you what I think, Don. You already know what I think, but I'm going to add to that. Well, it, Go ahead, it, Don. It, it's, uh, it's funny that we're talking about this because we had a bit of a debate over stout. Um, we, uh, we, like Don said, when you dump a, a barrel, you're going to get the particulate. So we actually, um, on the way to the uh, bottling line, do half micron to make sure we get as many things out as we can. Um, then we bottled the stout and we had to leave it in a cold area for a while. And when we did that, we noticed we were getting some haze on the bottom. Now, if you shake it, that goes away. Yeah. My understanding is I think it's polyphenols we're getting that are separating. So do we take it back out of the bottle and filter it again? Well, I didn't want to affect the flavor because I love the flavor so much. So I didn't want to take that chance. So we decided we're going to leave it alone. And if anybody phones or complains or whatever, we'll just tell them. This is what you do. If you don't like it, send it back. We'll give you your money back. And I think that was the best move because I don't want to affect it any more than we already have with the half micron. I think that strips enough out as it is because a barrel pull is always the best you'll ever get. Okay. And I will agree, but I'm going to go on to Steven. <laughs> what do you think? Um, I, and Don may say, I, I suspect that might be saponification as well in your in your whiskey, which we, we used to see as well. Um, we do a different uh, proofing process now to prevent that, trying not to shock the whiskey. And, and I think I asked Don about this before. We proof our whiskey with the same temperature water uh, to prevent any kind of reaction taking place there with shocking, say, uh, having room temperature whiskey and adding cold water to it. And uh, we are getting that saponification uh, taking place where we're getting some hazing in there. So we found with an elevage process with a step proofing process now that we're preventing that hazing from taking place even after filtration. So we, 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 um, yeah, we proof the, the whiskey with the same temperature water. Um, and I think in relation to chill filtration, uh, again, does, does the product taste good? Um, I think that's the real key, whether it's chill filtered or not, does this taste good to you? And, and I think there's going to be a lot of whiskey nerds out there that are always going to ask, you know, is this two row barley? Is this six row barley? What farm? I think those are just sometimes just questions that people just want an extra level of knowledge as well. Not always the case. And I know chill filtration has a, a real topic, but in the end, does the product in the glass taste good? Um, and I think that's, the, that's the most important thing. Thank you, sir. And Don, we're going back up. Dr. Don, I should say, we're going back yeah. up to you. So taste and, and, I think, and mouthfeel. Yeah, Look, and I yeah, yeah, and I think Don said it right. I think people want the feeling of tasting from a barrel. I think that's the end of the day. They want that experience. That what what does it taste like? I and mean, that's the storytelling, I think, part of, of drinking whiskey. Um, in terms of mouthfeel, for my, I can only comment on my brands. I, I don't think we see a lot of different, like I said, we've, we've paneled our panels for decades and they, they can't tell, tell the difference in terms of whether change of mouthfeel or, or nose, uh, to be honest with you. And that's the hard data I, I could see from our, our, our product. So now if you're in the 5% that can tell the difference, you know, you got a super tongue, that's fantastic. But, uh, the general population, we just don't, don't see it with our, our internal panels. Okay. Yeah. I think I can, and 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 I'm I'm going to keep saying well. that. But yeah, I, the, I, I, I will do the blender's well. test. The blender's test, which you mentioned in the book, is fantastic. Yeah. We talked about this before. Yeah. And I do have the black. Actually, I tried to actually paint actually glasses, so I didn't have to do this. <laughs> that didn't work out very well at all. But that's one of the summer projects a teacher will do. You just you've got some time in the summer to do stuff. So I tried that, and yeah. it didn't work at all. Yeah. But to do this it's with a my great wife, test. It's a great test. But, but I don't think it's just that. So I, I think I can if I had this. Well, in your blender's test, it's tell the difference between two things. And it could be any two things. But I like the idea of having a chill filled, non-chill filled sample. So if I could get distillers and you would need something like this, you would need a friend that's doing it. And you would have to have both. I would ask you for something that's both 
pre chill filled and something post and yeah. to actually yeah. go back to these in a blind test five times to see if you could tell yeah yeah and and, and just for the for, yeah, could, but. for the, for the blenders test what i find is i've been effective over the years when when we get asked about matching products and it's a yeah. simple little test you just get two glasses i'll put two glasses in front of you you get two glasses dark dark, dark prefer yeah if you're testing the color or or chill filtration if you can't tell the difference from the color, it doesn't matter. Uh, but if you had had two glasses, uh, and what you do is you put the two different whiskeys in, it, or what you want to test the difference, get a dot on the bottom of the glass, and you just nose it, taste it, whatever whatever kind of sensory test you want to do, and you pick one. You think you, I, I'm I'm detecting a flavor. I'm I think this one is banana. Let's say so the banana. You hand the glasses back to your friend, get them to mix it up for you. Hit the two glasses back in your hand, do it again. And I picked this one. This is the note I picked up the first time. Hand it back. They'll mix them up. If you can do that five times in a row and consistently pick the same sample, that means that you can tell a sensory difference. Yeah. That, that's my blender's test. Uh, I don't even know what you call the test, but that's what we do in our lab. If we think we're trying to say, hey, I think I've matched it, uh, or if you're trying to blend a, an issue out, we will do that to, to one another and, and uh, see this is, this, is, this is what we can know. There's no difference in between the two samples. Well, it's I'm going to ask the three of you, if you ever have a pre and post cold chill filter <laughs> thing, try to <laughs> bottle me a bit and I'll do that. And as talky as I think I might be at this point, I think I could because, and it's not just the tongue, it's the feel around the mouth that I, I tend to, yeah. but that's what draws me to a whiskey it is really the mouth feel. It, it really does make a difference for me in, in my mind. Anyways, we'll see one day, one day I'll be able to test I'll, get, I'll see if I can get and, you one. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I could give you an example, uh, Dolph, if you want, we chill filter our yeah, skin. Yeah. So I, okay. I mean, you could compare the difference, and there's, you know, there's distinctly a, a mouth feel and a visual feel, or a visual um, okay. notice on, on and, the louche. And let's just say your gin is made out of uh, it's full barley for your gin as well, right, Steve Lee? If I go back Correct. to memory, yeah, it's barley. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, kind sirs. Any of you want to give me that? I'll do it. I think it not just five. Chill filter, non chill filter. I think I need five different distilleries doing that five different times. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I'm just looking for samples now. <laughs> I, no, and I'll do it online too. So I'll, I'll make an ass out of myself if I want to, or I can, or no, I don't want to. But I will. Uh, here, let's uh, another quote. Uh, we must. Here we go. So, Donnie, state this in your epilogue. Uh, we must open the doors to let them, the customers, see how authentically we make our products. They must hear the sounds of milling grain, rolling of the barrels, the clashing glass on the bottom on the bottling line. Certainly, they want to experience the aromas and the grain elevator, distillery, the aging warehouse, the entire multi-sensory experience. Then, is summed up in the taste of your whiskey. The so whiskey is becoming less commercial, more experimental. We as whiskey producers must create a story that can be shared with friends. And you're back to the story, which I agree with. I like it a lot. Panel, do you agree with this statement? Trying to make it more personal with the customer. I know Don agrees with it because he wrote it. But so, so other Don, let's go Don and Steve. Uh, yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think <clears throat> um, we, we're always trying to give someone that experience. And like Don said, people want a barrel pull. People want to taste what's in the barrel. That's what they really want. And and we've actually played around with that a little bit. I know Don said you have to filter whiskey to make sure there's nothing in it. What we did for um, our cast drink corn that we released is we emptied the barrel, went through uh, just basically a screen to get as many of the big chunks out, and then we let it sit for two weeks. And then we racked off the top and checked it out and it was clear and that's what we actually bottled for the first i think 125 bottles so we actually we, we did a barrel pull and that's how we released it uh, and we had no sediment no nothing so it the, what we did work now the rest that's left definitely has to go through a filter so it's going to be the second release of that cask but uh, i and i think people like that experience and they like that story and it makes them feel like they're one step closer to the distillery like if you ever get a chance to do the jim beam experience uh, it, it's it's great because back in the day when I did it, when they actually dumped the Knob Creek that you'd be getting, 
they, they put a glass in the stream and handed it around. That's nice. Yeah. And, you know, you got to sample it. And like I've always said, the best whiskey is straight from the barrel. That's what I really, truly believe. And that's what we're trying to get is that experience to people. So they, they yeah. do get that. And your story works as well. The story of how you got the malted corn in the first place was interesting. And then yeah. the malting the corn, which I'd never had previous before. I, I still don't know if anyone else has malty corn and, and distilled that. And if they have it, good for them. But mm -hmm. you were the first. No, you're the first to distill it after the brewery went under. It's The story is really entrancing. And, and Don yeah. talks about the story. I love the story. It's just what brings you to that distillery. But the quote is uh, that I really liked is the entire multi-sensory experience then is summed up in the taste of your whiskey. So I love it. You're bringing everything together in the flavor that you're getting it at that moment. So what you, what you all saw at Jim Bean previously, and then it comes together with that one glass that you're sharing at that point in time that you brought off the still, which is kind mm -hmm. of cool. Mm -hmm. Steve Lee, how about you? And I know yeah. I'm pretty sure you agree with it because you've invited me to your distillery so that I could experience it myself, but I'll let you answer. That's okay. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, without question, it's a, a important. I think uh, when people visit the distillery, if you can make a connection to them, uh, something beyond just tasting what's in the glass just brings them into the distillery. So I, I think when you came to visit Dolph, I was like, come on a mashing day. We'll get you to shovel grain. Or, yep. or come on a day that we're distilling and you can Round taste the spirit off the still. So those, I, I don't think you actually shoveled any mash that day, did you? <laughs> no, because you and I and Nick went to the brewery in town. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> as your poor wacky, that poor guy. Yeah. What I so, did is I just emptied the, the, the barley into the grinder and we, we ground and we put it back in the bag. So we milked the barley, yeah. And yeah, I think those experiences it. for our customers, and I think that's one thing, you know, I, I talk about what small distilleries can do um, as opposed to the larger distilleries is bring people in, get them to bottle, get them to shovel grain, get them to help mill barley. All these things uh, will contribute to an experience. And I think um, what Dr. Don has been doing, you know, in those those blending workshops, I mean, I want to come to one of those blending workshops because of that experience that you would get. I mean, I, I, I'll fly out to come and do that. So mm -hmm. I think it's very important. That was my plan this summer. I was there. Yeah. Then my brother-in-law kicked the crap out of that one. I didn't go. But yeah. it was COVID-related. We did do that. Yeah. But Hopefully we can resurrect story. them and you can, we can get you guys there. It'll be a lot of fun. And it Never certainly will have lots of discussion. Hmm. I, I think it comes down to that quote is your hands, heart, mind. Uh, you want to be able to touch, feel, smell, use all your senses as much as you can. Uh, and then, then your heart will use in the, in the brands, uh, uh, what you're making. And it really is, um, it's simple that use all your senses. And I think, I think the stilling industry is, is set up perfectly for that. Perfectly for that. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, we've got a comment here from John Jamison. Yeah, we could drive to Windsor and he's also on the, on the, well, he's on the Alberta Scott study, but he's on my time frame where we might have the summer's off or something. So wow. that's a good idea. Uh, Don was great. And, and all of you and Steve Lee, when I went there and the memories that were created there, they're life memories and there's something that stick with you. They really do. And you've got the sensory experiment uh, where it experience and that's what, goes forward and don you and i with the three uh three what do we call that that tasting the three, three uh oh. the three horrible mistakes the, the, the some. <laughs> anyway, that was memorable because it was tasting something unique and something that's going to stick in my mind just like when i had a corked whiskey i knew it was a corked whiskey and i i drank it even though i knew it was corked because it just instilled a certain memory in my mind that I'm never going to forget. It's something that's emblazoned on there. So it was very helpful. Uh, gentlemen, we've got one, one last question. One very last question. And, and this is a little bit of a longer question. So I'm going to ask you to all be patient with me. Just a little bit patient if you can. So and, and I'm going to put this right here. And no, it's not a quote this time. I usually have so many quotes. This is not quoted. No quote. What do you think that 
Canadian whiskey, why, why do you think we have such a hard time with recognition? Now, it seems to be cheap booze in the States and frowned upon with Scotch fans here in Canada. And I'm talking my Alberta Scotch Society. I've been doing Canadian whiskey tastings. Every Tuesday I do a, a, a different distillery, but it's still not as accepted as Scotch. Okay. For whatever reasons, I think it has something to do with the culture and history. Ours is a rich, both culture, history, but we don't promote it individually. I know people do, but not individually like all of us. We don't carry the traditions forward. In Scotland and in the States, they had to fight their governments to survive the distilleries. It seems like a group fight bonding against oppressors. They hid their stills. They had networks of people that all worked together to get this and, and they're bonded to it. But there's nothing like that on a large scale in Canada. There was areas of prohibition here in Alberta, same thing, but nothing on a large scale. And then there's the mother-daughter, the father-son passing down a tradition related to drink, which I'm not sure is really happening here, but you hear about that in the States. We've been drinking this drink. My grandfather, my great-grandfather drank it. My grandfather, my father, this goes down. We hear about this a little bit with beer, but not so much with whiskeys. Crown Royal is really pushing this on TV, which is really good. I like that. but And I think it's working, but we don't do it. So I want you to think, if you can, is it because we haven't had enough choices for very long? Is it because provincial directions hampered us, maybe taxing us too much for too long? I don't know. but I And I know you've been asked these questions in certain forums in different ways, but... I'm wondering what us, rum runners, the people who had the, the, the Canadians running the, the whiskey on the Great Lakes to our American brethren, we are the guys that have the rebel roots. We have the history that we should be really proud of, and we're not taking advantage of that, or not on a grand scale. What else is keeping us from being out there as a premier whiskey. I know we in 1900s we sold tons. We had a lighter whiskey. We're all over the world. Why are we not considered premium? I think we are. And my wife says I think we are. But <laughs> I, I'm going to put that out to you. Why? Why? Why are my whiskey Scotch snobs still snubbing Canadian whiskey? Well, who? Uh, if you don't <laughs> mind, I'll, I'll I'll go first on this. <laughs> Um, I, I, I think it's hard to, it's hard to have the pride in Canadian whiskey when your own house of parliament has an official whiskey and it's a scotch every year. No. Do we? we yeah, yeah do. it's true. It, and, it and, and, and there has been things like the dissertation. There have been, know. you know, Wiser's legacy, the lot forties. There's been so many from there, even, you know. Uh, some of the 40 Creek that's come out, the Confederation Oak, why wasn't that the whiskey of Parliament? But no, we get, you know, na name the great Scotch distillery of where, whenever or whatever they, they choose every year. And, and I can't understand that. But when your own government doesn't show support for your industry, you know, what, why, what makes the Canadian people want to say, hey, Canadian whiskey is great. Okay. At one point, it was one of the most sold whiskeys in the world. And we, we had that, uh, but yeah. the Americans were drinking more Canadian whiskey than they were American whiskey at one point, if I understand nice. correctly. Uh, so I, I don't know. Like, if, if your own government doesn't get behind you, it, it, it's hard. It's it's like an uphill battle. And maybe this will be our battle to get us to the point where we are premium if we just keep fighting against that. Let's change that. Yeah. That's my two cents. I like it. And uh, love it. Okay. I don't know why I didn't know that. Steve Lee, did you know that? Maybe it's just Ontario guys that know this. Steve Lee, did you I know, know that? No, I, I, I did know that, actually. Oh, yeah. All right, our it's just our local MP is is talked about it. He's he's given us uh, some some support and, and has mentioned that. And I was like, that's a that's a great question. Okay. Now, I, I think we're experiencing a change. I think there's going to be ebbs and flows throughout history. And now you're asking us um don and i about why we think canadian whiskey is not popular and, and dr don just wrote a book on the history of canadian whiskey so we couldn't ask for a better guy to answer that question yeah, yeah. but i i think we're experiencing a renaissance i think we're going to see some changes 
um, coming. I, I think John Hall was kind of in the front of that change. Yeah. I, I think Dr. Don is coming and I think the craft distilling mm-hmm. industry is going to be following on that, the heels and, and we're going to start to get some more recognition. So um, change is coming. I think there's some good things that are happening. Yeah, I, I agree with John Hall. He kicked us in the ass. Um, <laughs> I I think it's yeah yeah. Um, I I I actually think it's a disp- Don. I agree with you on that too on the Parliament thing. That one pisses me off. It really, uh, it, it has for a while as well. Um, I think it's been happening a long time, probably post uh probably since about 1970 1980 and i think it's industry consolidation that's created the problem um i i think the big players in the world ended up coming buying Hiram walker crown royal uh alberta distillers and if you look at and and there's more out there i'm not picking on 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 those exclusively but the larger producers Mm -hmm. are owned by uh companies that are not located in canada Yep. I, I think that actually probably changed our industry. Probably 1970 was a good time for us. After that, when, once the consolidation occurred, when people were drinking vodka in the 1980s, when when people were buying all that stuff, that they created the Canadian whiskey category like a cash cow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they did not allow the blenders and distillers of that time to get out into the public and talk about the good stuff things in the story of Canadian whiskey and we lost our way. I think that those three decades, 70s, 80s, 90s, and maybe even another 2000 when John kind of entered the picture, um, we lost our way. I actually think we lost our way. And you, you saw in the 1990s, that wasn't the first time you started master distillers and master blenders from the scotch and bourbon world started getting out front and center in front of the public. Mm-hmm. You'd never see a Canadian. You would never see a Canadian out front and center. And I, we couldn't get out there. And, and as part of the motivation of writing these books is telling our story. I use the word storytelling probably dozens and dozens of time in the book, as Dolph, as you read. And I think that's part of the problem is that we have lost our storytelling ability with Canadian whiskey getting out there. And Steve Lee, I agree with you. You can see a change. And I can really see the change um, that... Um, the Canadian Whiskey Awards is a great example of it. When I first started doing the Canadian Whiskey Awards, hey, we can put it in there. How many people entered something? It was probably us, John Hall, and Diageo. <laughs> That's that was it. Albert. Now it's like, holy crap! The competition is fantastic. I look forward to it this year. It's probably more samples than ever. There is a change, and I think it just shows the quality of competition has just etched us up. And I think we're all motivating one another. And and and, and I I. I I think Steve Lee, you're right. You're right, Don. You're right. I think there there is a a, a renaissance coming, but I think we got to keep the pressure on as Canadians to go and mm-hmm. and tell that story to Canadians, and that and and to the rest of the world yeah. as well. Sometimes Canadians don't recognize a good thing until it sells elsewhere. Roots, yeah, for right. example, Blackberry, for example. There's many different examples. That that's the thing with Canadians. It's they're very odd like that. Though, until we're a success elsewhere, then, but. I, I mean, we keep trying. We keep trying. We keep trying. I don't know if you guys agree with that side, but I think that I think we I lost do. our way a little bit. Uh, you know, no. and we're too humble. I think we don't promote it as much, and and yeah. we really should. And because you've been here, all of you have been in this situation, either presenting whiskeys to other people. But I've got a 22 year old PX cask, and if I have a 22 year old Scotch compared to your 22 year old px cask people will go to the scotch first blind, not so much. yeah my, my wife says blind not so much it'd be great if you you tried it side by side now for me it's great i'm, I'm i have a society of people that i can give things to and promote things and there's an education going on within people within the industry but i i think it's going to take time before yeah. it does change and and don you've said that but the canadian whiskey awards they're getting bigger and bigger but we still don't promote it to the same amount that say they would in scotland certain awards that they have where they'll have two on online guys talking for seven hours online where someone like me is actually watching it as well how many people would watch that here i think more and more if if we promoted it 
Yeah, it's a I, storytelling, I, Delpha. That's a storytelling, I think. And, and we've yeah, we got, we got a great base. We get pushed by the by the, the government, too. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not just that. And certain governments uh, do If we take a look job. at what the Irish whisk story. Nope. Go for it. I, I was going to say what's happened with the Irish whiskey industry really in the in the past 10 or 15 years, there was a concerted effort to really push Irish whiskey. And, we, and we've seen that uh, that that category really grow. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. we need support, and, and, too. Certainly. Steve Lee, I remember I remember back in uh, 1996 when I said you couldn't even give a bottle of Jameson away. Yeah. And it, no, but uh, no, you it really couldn't. But now it's like the, you're right. They they really pushed again. They they went out and told that story, a little bit of Irish and everybody. Uh, yeah. That I mean, they, they did well. There was an Irish bar everywhere, like a pub, and and that helped. I think too in every city and every mm -hmm. town, right? I mean, that that's the kind of thing. It's going to take many different ways. Governments, uh, our marketing teams, our own, our own storytelling abilities, just getting uh, us producers out there front and center just like john john had the right right recipe for success like mm -hmm. i said he kicked us in the ass and uh and he, he knew but what people he was didn't doing. hear about it john <laughs> no you said that but but people didn't hear about it i yeah. i still talk about I'll, I'll i'll mention any of your whiskeys to somebody and there's so many people i haven't heard about them. confederation oh still people don't know about it it's been around for a while it did very well yeah. and on on devon's awards he was distiller of the of not the century the decade the i think it was decade. Yeah. lifetime and, achievement award yeah but there's still people that haven't heard of these stories within canada and i, I think it's marketing more than anything else to tell you the truth i, I but, really but, do as well but we also have davin who's out there at forefront and pushing you know canadian <laughs> whiskey but if you go to scotland yeah. how many guys out there are scotch experts that are pushing 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 like yeah. Th th that's there's just so many of them and you know yeah. we have very few what well, we have more we're getting more the societies are getting better um you know i i think canadian whiskey is going to be the next big whiskey i think right. um uh, no I, I i actually see trends like people are actually looking for more interesting stuff they're looking for more diverse whiskeys from canada but they're also you know looking to sample new things and and you know that was rare because before it was a you you, you you know, you drank Crown Royal or CC, right? Yeah, and you mix it with ginger ale and that. That used to be whiskey. In my world, that was whiskey. Yeah. Although my dad used to have, my dad used to have cases of Barclay Square. So I would take one of those every once in a while. So. I have the recipe of that, by the way. <laughs> oh, that, that'd be great. I'd love to reproduce that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what you're that. talking about. Barclay Square? Barclay yeah. Square. I, I, I saw that. What Fair the hell model. is that brand? Yeah, I'll have to look it up for you, Don. <laughs> You'll have to direct I'll, message I'll me on Instagram that. or something and remind me to look it up for you in the new year. That'd be awesome. Yeah. 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 All right. All right, gentlemen. Last comments before I wrap this up. We'll do our after after jam talk about any of this. But uh, let's go around the horn. We'll go Don Steveley, Dr. Don, just to wrap anything up or last questions or comments. And then. I'll well, sign up. Everybody write your MP and tell them Canadian whiskey needs to be the whiskey of parliament. End of story. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think the winner of the Canadian whiskey awards should be the whiskey uh, that's presented in parliament the there next year. Yeah. If there's enough supply. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, certainly true. If you only have a hundred <laughs> bottles left on, I don't know, but no, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that'd be the only kick, that'd be the only uh, caveat. But there's lots to choose from from the Canadian whiskey oh, yeah. awards you, you can absolutely sure, put in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would say just just uh, just the marketing side of things. You know, uh, you can follow me at CDN Whiskey Doc on Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, Instagram, and uh, JPWeiserstour.ca if you're looking for the books. So uh, and buy the damn books. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. At least get you, at least get you thinking, and and I think that's the important part. And telling the story of canadian whiskey mm -hmm. and, and let's stick with that let's stick with the story because i like the story concept more than anything else that i've heard about promoting canadian whiskey and what we have in our individual distilleries i i really yeah. do you yeah. everyone's got a story tell the story make the story stick with the person visiting you and make it yeah. personal i really do i think that's fantastic uh any last comments sorry don was that it i, I don't know if i interrupted you we're good. No, I'm good. Right. No, no, thanks. Thank you for having I'm us on. Yeah. 
That's it. That's all the time we got. Well, we could have more, but I'm wrapping it up. Whiskey Brothers, Whiskey Sisters. It's it's been a fun evening. It's been a great start to my Friday evening. I got to tell you. So, uh, thanks to the listeners, all of you. Thanks to our our lovely panel here. We we, we learned a lot from you. So, Don Steveley and Doctor Don, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Doctor Don, for writing these two books. I'll read the the first one over Christmas, and that way I won't have the same questions for you the next time. Uh, join me. Uh, this is my next plug. Join me on Saturday. Uh, here, I need this. January 8th at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 9 o'clock for you guys in Ontario. For our guests, this is my new book, The Spirit of Rye. And I'm doing this over three, possibly four weeks with author Carlo DeVito. And this is this is a sizable tome, guys. So this is a lot of information we're doing. You know, I love my rye whiskey, so we're we're talking about this. This is the New Year tome, and and it's what you want to do the at least three weeks in January, maybe one in February. We'll we'll see how fast I get through this one. And if you don't want to miss any any of these special interactions, like subscribe and. I just want to say this is my last one of the year. So Merry Christmas. Happy 2021. Hope we see you in 2022. Thank you all very much. And if you have a little bit left in, in your glass, we're going to hold these up, gentlemen. And so, so here's the good company. Here's the good whiskey. Here's the good conversation. And here's to seeing you all sometime soon. I hope to see you all in person. 2022. I know I'm hoping. Definitely. Definitely. Slancha, guys. Slancha. Cheers. Slancha. Cheers. 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 Che